all of you guys. I appreciate you. And by extension, I appreciate everyone who's on the call. Um, I wasn't kidding when I said uh, I was just listening to four of the most optimistic guys I've ever heard on my in my life. And so if I sound from time to time like I'm being pessimistic, I want you to know that I'm really just being realistic uh, because I'm as opportunistic as any guy you're going to ever find. And we're going to talk about that in a second, but I just want you to know that I'm really bullish on where we're heading, but it's going to be a rocky road to get there. So here we are on April 25th. Uh, my name's Dave Steck. I'll bore you a little bit with me at the beginning, but not too much. Um, and I'll welcome you from lockdown in paradise. So uh, this morning, my wife Poon uh, was kind enough to take a photo outside off our balcony and to let you know how bad I have it in Puerto Rico uh, with, of course, Gene and Rob and Scott and Brent, I don't even know or fear here, but there are so many people who are enjoying life here in Puerto Rico uh, during lockdown. And, uh, you know, there are only three things I do every day. I make money, I do good, and I have fun. And all of those things I'm doing more of than I ever have in the past. So I want you to realize that there's a great opportunity ahead of you, but it's not going to be an obvious road. So before we dive in, just a little bit of gratitude. And let me just minimize the screen here so I can see most of my screen. So, um, yeah, bear with me. All right. So thank you to Rob, uh, Scott, Gene, Brent, and the entire EXP team of which I view all of you on this call. Uh, I always like to express gratitude because I've had an expression for about 40 years of my life that I created when I was living in London uh, for three years, going to school and working and all that. And it was grateful, but not content. Uh, every day I wake up, I'm so grateful. Uh, I'm really fortunate to be here and to be able to share with you. Um, I'm just not content. I feel like there's an opportunity to do more. Uh, and of course, the guys invited me to, to share my State of the Union. Really, I hope to help you, your partners, your clients, everyone during uncertain times. I'm told somewhere around 100,000 people will eventually view this. And of course, I'm not getting paid a penny. So I start right out with telling you, in short, I'm already pissed. Uh, but somehow I'll get through it all because I care for Rob. He's a close, dear friend of mine, and by extension, you and the rest of the guys at EXP. And I really do hope that you're going to not only enjoy this, but profit from it. Uh, because otherwise, it was informational, but it didn't really change your life in a positive way. So how did I actually get here? Well, as the guy said, by way of Mexico, <laughs> um, I met this guy. Uh, on the street down there in Mexico. No, actually, I met him uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, in fact, I met you in Virginia, Rob, before even that. And of course, Rob lives down the street, as he said, with Jen, and there's my beautiful bride, Poon. And uh, I was speaking at a conference in San Diego, and uh, fortunately, Rob and Jen were kind enough to show my wife the way to get to Mexico uh, back in February. And wouldn't it be nice to be back there? Oh, my God. I could only be there for a day or two because I literally had to fly in from a conference and then had to fly back to a conference. And I didn't get the chance to be able to enjoy much more than hanging out with Rob and Scott and Gene and Brent for a day uh, in an amazing environment where at the end of the day, I was able to sit down in the morning and have an amazing meal with my bride. Uh, and after speaking in Mexico, I got so many emails so many phone calls. In fact, my office manager, Kathy, didn't talk to me for like two days. And I didn't even give anyone my contact information, but you guys tracked me down like the dog I am. So I really wasn't prepared for it. I was just there to speak at a dear friend's you know, event that invited me. I don't know if I got through and responded to everyone who communicated with us, but I just want you to know that I heard what you said. Um, Many of your comments were compliments or thank yous. Some, you know, do I have investment funds for you to invest money? Some were about the economy and real estate and private lending. Others uh, wanted to know what else, you know, we might do that would be of help. And then some of you had kind of specific advice that you were looking for. And I did my best, but I'm telling you, I was pretty overwhelmed. So I read over those emails before I jumped on the call. 
And I want you to know that we've got somewhere for you to go in the future uh, so that those questions, um, those that interest that you had can be served moving forward, not just randomly you trying to track me down. So I also want to say thank you because at the end of the day, I don't have to be here and you don't have to be here. Um, I've done really well in my life financially and otherwise, and I don't have to be here. And you've all been successful without me, so you certainly don't need me. I really do believe that my wife or my family and I would probably stumble through the rest of our life without you, and you'd be great. But I think we could probably help each other, especially in the midst of uncertainty. And because we're all stuck at home, or frankly, I hope we're stuck at home because we can get through the pandemic faster. We're all hoping it will end soon. So regardless of what you hear or what you believe, you've taken time out of your day to listen to my thoughts. And what I want you to know is it's all about being the victor, not the victim. I can't remember the last time I was a victim. There was a downturn in the economy in 1979 and 80, and real estate took a dive. There was another one in 8990, real estate took a dive. There was another one in 2005 through 2006, real estate took a dive. Guess what? There's likely to be some correction as a result of all this. But real estate tends to lag those other things and it leaves clues. That's why I love real estate because when real estate is gonna correct, it leaves clues in advance so that I'm not in the position of being surprised and seeing my stock price drop by a third overnight or seeing oil drop to the point last week literally this week oil dropped to the point where people are literally coming to you and saying if you'll take this off my hands it's for free if you can in fact i'll pay you to take it off my hand it's a crazy market that we're in and so for you to stick your head in the sand is just shameful because what i'm going to tell you is going to actually help you understand where we are and then allow you to position yourself to win from it. So what am I going to do? Talk about the global reset. Talk about volatility and the fact that it'll equal opportunity for you. Do a quick economic update. Talk about what you want to do, the five things that our family's doing that maybe you can cheat off us and do yourself. Be a learner, not just learn it. I'm sure you don't know what I mean by that, but you will. And then give you a couple of last thoughts. There's a global reset happening. This is something that hasn't happened in the past. That's one of the things that's so uncertain about what, what's going on moving forward is that the entire globe is resetting. As Rob and he mentioned that he's one of my access insiders, we have a small group of people of which Rob is part of it that hear from me weekly uh, as well as my family on what we're doing. And they have heard me say for the last year that there were too many things that were uncertain for us not to have a recession. What happened was that oil and COVID-19 weren't on the list. The stock market and real estate were at their historical peaks. So by definition, when any market is at its peak, it has more downside than upside. So when you're investing near the top, you're really more of a speculator. If you know where the bottom is, you're truly an investor. And I believed that cash would be king. So last year I started stockpiling cash because I felt like there would be great opportunities that America might just be on sale again. After all, that's how I viewed it a decade or so ago. And I wasn't just generating cash for investment purposes, but I was doing it to make sure that my family and I could weather the storm, that we would be in a position during the ravages of a recession to be able to capitalize on it. So how how was I so confident in where we were going and why I felt as though we were heading there? We do an enormous amount of research and our data sources are extensive and we spend tens of thousands of dollars a month trying to figure this out. I don't do it for you. I do it for my family so that we don't make mistakes. We've made money on 99.9% .9 of our deals. I won't show you our scoreboard because it's not relevant today. All you need to know is that we lose one-tenth of one percent. We're not perfect, no one is, but we're as perfect as you can get. It's because we cheat off other people and that we're willing to invest in ourselves through research and other things. So now let's talk about volatility and the fact that it does mean opportunity. 
and what you ought to be doing as a real estate professional now. I deliver, as Rob said, the State of the Union. And I, I started in 2005 on the right-hand side there at Harvard when I talked about the fact that the market was going to implode and that I was getting out of the market because it was going to take a nosedive in 2006. Guess what? I was wrong. It took its nosedive in February of 2007. So as I always tell you, and I think I started with this, forecasts are always wrong. The only question is by how much and in which direction. Fortunately, I've been right in the right direction. And in 2008, to that audience at the bottom there, I said, I'm going all in in Las Vegas. Well, you can imagine how that went over because it was the foreclosure capital of America and seven out of every 10 homes, 68% were underwater. So you can imagine I got thrown out of that room too. In 2011, I said, we are at or near the bottom of the market. So if you don't take advantage of this now, shame on all of you, because I told you what was gonna happen in 2005. I told you in 2008, I don't know how many of you did anything about it, but I'm telling you in 2011, the market is gonna bottom soon. It did in January of 2012. So at the end of the day, right now, take inventory of yourself. What do I do? Well, I've recently taken inventory of myself. I'm a market timer in real estate. I got out in 2005, I got in in 2009, I got out in 2018, and I plan, in to, get, plan to get back in soon. But see, I do something different than you. You're a real estate agent or a broker. I am a real estate investor. One of my sons has a real estate license. My other son uh, built one of the biggest lending companies as an LO. Um, at the end of the day, we are very involved in real estate and lending, but as investors, we think differently than you. So you should be going pedal to the metal right now, whereas we have times where we have cause for pause because the single most important word in real estate is timing. If you can get the when right, the where, the how, the who, and the what are insignificant. Imagine getting in your favorite market back in 2011 before it took off in 2012. That is pretty cool. That's why I'm a real estate investor, but I'm an investor depending upon where we are in the market cycle. I get in, I get out, most of the time I'm in, but a lot of the time I'm out. Because of course, the most important thing in real estate is to get out at the right time and get in. Which of those is the most important? Think about that for a minute. Is it more important to get out of the market at the right time or in? The answer is to get out. Because you know what happened in 2006 and seven, and most of you didn't even have any idea it was coming. A lot of people can get crushed. So we get out and get in at the right times. And folks like Rob, as part of our insider group, are able to not just earn active income off commissions, not just earn um, recurring income off of those of you who generate commissions as well, but they can generate passive recurring income off investments. So what I want you to do is ultimately win the game of life. And that starts with making money. And so as a real estate investor, you can do it, but that's your choice. That's not what I'm pushing today. I'm also a private lender. So I loan money to real estate investors because it allows for me to scale the business and help my flippers know what's coming, where it's coming next, what's happening, how they can capitalize on it, and then I give them the money to do it. At all times in the market cycle, I can do this because flipping works anytime. I try to be a great husband and a partner to my wife, Poon, and I try to be a great dad. I really wanna optimize my family. I believe I was put on the earth to be a great dad. All this other stuff is just a way to make money. I have two sons. Uh, my youngest one, Josh, is getting a lot of attention. Uh, he was on TV there in the middle this week uh, because he's looking to build another billion dollar company in real estate. Between 2013 and 2000 and 17 or 18, he actually built the largest hard money lender in America in four years, which became a billion dollar company. And now he's excited about the real estate play and has built another company that's already on its path to success. Um, so at the end of the day, we're serious about real estate. We're not just doing this for the heck of it. I guess what we could do if we were smarter is we could you know, invest in a little better lighting. You see the guy on the left there, 
is in a studio and the lady in the rights probably in the studio and my son he told me it was at 6 a.m in the morning on the fourth level he's got a home in san francisco that's four stories and he had to get up to the top because his three-year-old and his six-month-old would be trying to chase him otherwise and i said dude you got to get some makeup and some better lighting there come on anyway so economic update for any of you who've heard me say this before uh you can't say i didn't tell you so but i've been showing a slide to rob and to others in fact i showed this in mexico think about that in a minute i showed this slide in mexico the month before this whole thing started unraveling and i said i've shown this slide at every presentation in the last year here i am in mexico it's february and i'm telling you to expect a recession in 2020 and i gave all these ideas and all these things that could potentially trigger a recession. And I honestly expected more than one of them to do it. Well, I didn't see oil prices going to where they were. I certainly didn't see coronavirus coming into our future like it has. So even folks like me who are market timers, who have an economics background, who speak at university, even people like me are still struggling to understand how we got here. Now, I understand actually what the past the recent past has meant and why it's happened but the question really is where are we going for the future well we already had a situation where we had a house of cards now i don't expect that you're economists i don't expect that you're even business majors but i'm telling you when you're at or near the peak of something like the stock market or junk bonds or the unicorn valuations privately held companies that grow to a billion dollars like my son's company or Airbnb or Uber, and there's record high auto debt and student loans and real estate and non-bank mortgages. All of this debt is gonna to have to be structured in some way at some point, and it's not all gonna happen by this summer. So I'm telling you, it's not gonna be the V shape that you might hope. Now add to that the businesses that are laden with record debt. You see, public company debt grew four times faster than revenue, from 2009 through 2018, that's a 10 year period. Imagine your household and all of a sudden your debt, your expenses are growing four times faster than your income. How that, how's that gonna work out for you? The good news as you look at the bottom is that building materials and real estate and home building have actually performed better. They don't have as much debt, which is really good in the building segment because the debt that they have doesn't have to be repaid that quickly. Now, I'm sorry, I don't want to get, I don't want to lose you and I don't want to speak over your head. I don't mean to do that, but this is really important because it ultimately kind of boils down to the house of cards that COVID basically tipped over and the ghost towns of the United States that it created. Here's Vegas on a Saturday. Can you imagine on a Saturday in Las Vegas or in Times Square or in Washington DC where we found a person or Chinatown on a Saturday in San Francisco and the beaches of Southern California shutting down, the whole country shutting, who could have imagined that two months ago, seriously? I mean, if I had told you that two months ago, in fact, if I'd told you that when I saw many of you in Mexico, you would have looked at me like I had two heads and I wouldn't have been invited back to talk. But at the end of the day, we're somewhere. Where is that? Today, here's where we are. We're somewhere in this situation called a pandemic, which is likely the greatest in 100 years. We're also the greatest economic contraction since the Great Depression, where I think Scott mentioned it earlier, weekly unemployment claims are 26 million dollars in five or 26 million people in five weeks, which is greater than the 23 million job gains that have been gained in the last 10 years following the financial meltdown. Think of that, 10 years is 520 weeks. We lost more jobs in five weeks. In 1% of the time, we lost more jobs. It's a crazy phenomenon that we've got going on. While oil prices are going through the bottom and all of this is happening simultaneously. It's not like one of these things is happening. They're all happening. The greatest central bank can, uh, or government intervention of all time. And at the end of the day, because it's all happening simultaneously, 
including the positive stuff that the bank and the feds are trying to do, it puts us in a position where the word we hear most often these days is unprecedented. Well, you hear it all the time. I almost get tired of saying it because it's so overused, but look it up sometime. It's an adjective and it means never done and never known before. Think about that. It's never been done in our lifetime and we've never known what it's like. So when we say unprecedented and we refer back to things like the bubble in 2001 or 2018, which were also viewed and characterized as unprecedented, they weren't. They were meltdowns to be sure, but unprecedented? No. I've studied 1979-80 and the collapse after that, 89-90, and of course, I predicted the 2005 crash, and here we are looking at those, and I can tell you, I'm really having a hard time on the prediction on this one. I just believe it's going to be longer than we think, but I'm always reminded this is the time to be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. I probably don't have to tell you whether people are greedy or fearful now, but people are on fear alert. So it's a great time if you choose to take advantage and turn the economy into your economy. So here are those five things. Number one, prepare. There are three stages that are family. You know, we have a fair amount of wealth. So we've created a family office where we treat our family like a business not in the cold sense, because we're still hugging and kissing and loving on each other, but we're in four different cities managing different businesses that all roll up to this empire. Now, we're not Rockefeller and we're not Trump, but we've done pretty well compared to those of you who are likely on this call. Yeah, on February 28th, my sons and I had a call with the guy in the picture on the bottom on the lower left hand side. So, Dr. Jordan Schlein is sort of the doctor for the ultra wealthy, uh, the people who roll off your tongue, whose names roll off your tongue. And he is the CEO of a company called Private Medical, which is a referral only uh, program. And there are only eight or 900 clients. So we had a call with him and he told us this would be much worse than people were being told. And of course we were naturally skeptical. I'm not an epidemiologist. I don't know anything about what's going on. Uh, from a from a health standpoint, but you know when somebody that smart tells you something, it's like the guys who kicked this off today. When they tell you something, they know what they're talking about. You know they know how to build a company like EXP, and they know how to help you build it with them. Well, I don't know anything about health, but I know a lot about real estate. And we went into war room mode quickly as a family. Because I believe, and we've always believed, that every time we go into crisis, we prepare for three things, or at least do three things to prepare. Number one, we insure. What does that mean? Well, think of insurance, property insurance, health insurance. Why do you buy it? Because you want someone else to accept the risk for what might happen to you or your property. Well, you should have been doing estate planning. You should be doing, you know, buying N95 masks, food, water cash, guns. I mean, desperate people do desperate things. I don't plan on using one, but I certainly don't want to not be insured against the likelihood of it happening. Number two, de-risk. That means you've got to de-risk your family and de-risk your financials. Our family went into quarantine. We just didn't mess with this. We decided we were going into quarantine, and it was right after I got back from a trip uh, to San Francisco, where I flew out on a Wednesday, and the, and as the world was unraveling, I decided to fly back on Thursday. I little, literally, literally spent 28 hours flying from uh, Puerto Rico to San Francisco and back because things unraveled so quickly. So optimize your financials, and I know it's been very difficult for most of you, but it was easy for us because we were anticipating a recession. We just didn't know what was going to trigger it. So we were exactly where we needed to be, but we had to go into quarantine. And then in parallel, in week one, where we're ensuring and making sure that we're safe and healthy, while we're de-risking, we're also optimizing. That's what I got. want you folks to think about is, what are you going to do to optimize? Look, wealth is going to be transferred. The only question is, which end of the receipt are you going to be on? 
And so I believe I want to be on the rece on the reception side, not the giving side, because I know volatility equals opportunity. This is not my first rodeo. Well, rather than show you a lot of other bad news charts, which I could clearly show you about deaths and new cases and all that, let me give you the good news. If we had not taken measures, look where we'd be. The fact that we did has been difficult for all of you, and it's been tough on our economy. But at the end of the day, if we hadn't done it, I can assure you that from a hockey stick standpoint, we'd be in a place that none of us would want to be. So we have to do the things we have to do when we have to do them. What do you do at every point in the market cycle? Well, look at optimism there on the left. Think 2003, because all of you are real estate agents. If you go back a decade or brokers, you know exactly where I'm going. You were optimistic in 2003. You were excited in 2004. In 2005, you were thrilled. In 2006, you were euphoric. And the people who were euphoric were hearing me tell them that the market was going to implode. So you can imagine how I was viewed. Um, at that time, 2007 happened and people started becoming complacent. They were in denial. They became anxious in eight. Then they were in full-fledged denial in nine. Well, we're not in 2010 or 11, but that star probably represents where we are today, if you think about it. People are fearful. And in some cases, they don't know what the future holds, or they're starting to hear of people that they know who've been infected, and they're starting to be a little panicked. There are some people who aren't getting government assistance as quickly as they'd like, and they're not taking as much control of their, themselves and their situation as perhaps they should have, so they naturally revert to anger and want to blame other people. Now, look, I grew up in a trailer park for the first 20% of my life. My parents had an eighth grade education. Um, I ate mayonnaise sandwiches for 22 months while my dad, or after my dad fell off a job that he was working on as an iron worker. I know what it's like to be angry. I know what it's like to have a scarcity mindset. And I'm telling you, get over it. It's not going to do you any good. This is the time where you need to realize that the other 80% are thinking that way. So you need to be in the 20%. If you can be in the top 20% of the 20%, like the guys who just introduced me, now you're in the top 4% and you can capitalize on anything because you've got the confidence. What do I have that you don't have possibly? Well, I've got three things. One, I have research. Second, I got experience. Third, I have knowledge that I've generated over the years. That's allowed me to give me the confidence to know that no matter what anybody throws at me, my family and I are going to come out on top. I don't think I know it all. I know I don't know. It. In fact, I always say, I don't know 99% of stuff in life. But this real estate thing, this lending, I got that nailed. So that's where I focus my energy. And that's where I hope that you can benefit from what I know. Number two, remember I said number one is to plan and prepare. Number two is to take what the market gives you and survive. Now, normally when I show this slide, I'm talking about the real estate market. I don't always do the same things in the real estate market at different points in the market cycle. Sometimes I buy and hold as an investor. Sometimes I flip. Sometimes I lend. Sometimes I do vacation rentals. Sometimes I do conversions of apartments. to con I do different things depending upon where we are in the market cycle because I know exactly what to do on that wavelength that I just showed you on the previous slide. But now many of you have to survive and I get that. And all three of these government agencies are going all in to save you and to save the housing market for you. Now, that's important because if you don't seize the moment and pivot quickly if you need to, you're not going to be able to thrive. You know, why am I on this call? I mean, I obviously don't need to be and I don't need them. I'll tell you why. I've gone through three stages of my life. I get to survive. That's what I had to go through while I was in a trailer park. Then I got to thrive, and now I get to matter. I literally get to matter to people like Rob and by extension you, and that's important. Now, one of my trivia questions here is, what percentage of pol politicians have been trained in business or accounting or finance or economics? Well, remember that Pareto principle, that 80-20 rule I mentioned? Turns out that 13% have been trained in business, accounting or finance, and 8% in economics. That means 80% have not been trained 
for what we're doing right now and what they're doing. And what are they doing? They're pumping money into the economy. And we all hope that it's the right thing. But what we know is it's adding to our national debt at a ridiculous rate. You see, when you go back and look in 2008 and through 2011, they increased the national or our Fed's balance sheet by $2 trillion. And it took them three years to do it. Well, you know what happened? $2.268 billion, $2.268 trillion rather, in a few weeks was added to their balance sheet in order to try to jumpstart this economy. Now there's another 484 billion, a half a trillion more. And I got news for you, that's not the end. It's still gonna be coming. So the government's gonna do whatever it has to do right now, which is more than it did before and quicker than it has ever in history. Now, the money is starting to show up for many of you. You're all getting either the payment protection plan or you're getting EIDL or you're getting stimulus money like a check like that. Or you're getting a, if you have direct deposit with the IRS, you're getting a account status like that where an ACH, pay, ACH payment is going into your account if you're married for $2,400. I underline this thing that I'm sure most of you have not heard of because, uh, before because it's something that I learned when I was in graduate school in economics, and that is moral hazard. The notion that there's a shift of risk from you to somebody else. Now, what do I mean by that? If you buy insurance, that means that you have then shifted the risk of any loss to somebody else. If your health's bad, your insurance company pays. If your property gets vandalized, the insurance company reimburses you. So that's this notion of moral hazard. And there's a certain amount of insurance that we need in our lives if we're smart. Will property ownership ever be the same again? And how does it relate to that moral hazard thing? Well, in America, the government can't just arbitrarily decide to take your property from you. You're a landlord or you're a homeowner. So what could they do? Well, they can control and influence people who have to do with property. You see, the government is overruling lease agreements now and mandating rent forbearance. So rents are being pushed out. The government is also saying it's okay not to pay your mortgage payment. They're also telling lenders that they can't foreclose and they're telling landlords that they can't evict. Well, I understand why that's being done, but ask yourself three questions. Number one, how do you as an agent or as a real estate investor, price these facts into your purchase decisions or those of your clients. How do you do that in the future? Because it's a real risk. Prices could come down given that an investor doesn't want to buy if they can't collect rent. So I'm asking myself, how will this moral hazard, the notion that what I am potentially going to impact is now being shifted in terms of accountability to somebody else. I worry about myself if I fall prey to doing things to rely on others. Don't rely on others. Don't allow your family to rely on others. Other than you, of course, your clients, your tenants, make sure that they know this is the time to take responsibility because other things are happening demographically. You see, if I had started the year 2020 and given you a forecast of what was gonna happen, I could have told you competently that there's gonna be 3.8 million births, there's gonna be 2 million marriages, about half of those in divorce, and another 3 million or so in deaths. I could have told you that because I can look at statistics and know that. Well, now we've got a black swan called COVID-19. Well, let's talk about divorces. It's generally felt that because we're in closer proximity to those that sometimes we don't want to be, thank God, present company excluded, because my wife's the best woman on the planet. Guys, I got her. You get second. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, how are you going to get to get? It's expected that divorces are going to go up. We know deaths are going to go up because they're already going up. Marriages are going down, not because people don't want to get married, but be because they're delaying them. So if marriages are delayed, births are going to be impacted. And the question is how many people who are in isolation who aren't being divorced or getting divorced are having more children. And those that 
are they offsetting the number of people who would have gotten married and maybe had first children? So there are things that are happening that we in real estate need to be sensitive about because what this does is allow for us to predict demographic shifts, international migration. How many people are able to get across the border? You've seen what the president has recently done. He's stopped all the green cards and all the other things so that people can't get across the border unless they have a very, if they have to have an unusual circumstance that requires that they work here. And so what's gonna happen is, what was already declining over the last few years is gonna to go to zero. We could see population growth of only 0.35%. That's a third of 1%. It was predicted back in 2017 to be twice that. So things are shifting. That means the number of households are going to shift. That means the number of divorces that will create demand for one person housing is gonna be impacted. It's already happened in China. And it also means that markets are gonna turn from very strong to strong, which is where we were in the fourth quarter, to now a situation where markets are slow or very slow. Google allows all of us to know what's going on. But of course you use Google to find something where we pay for what's called predictive analytics to see what Google searches are happening so we can match what's happening in your mind with what's likely to happen as a result of it. So we've been able to track unemployment because as unemployment went from virtually nothing up to 6 million, we saw search results going up in the preceding week. We knew it was gonna come down from 6 million to five and to four because search results started uh, dropping. So new home Google search results are down 24%. And some of this can be impacted by builder spending. We also know that there's an opportunity for pent up demand on the other side. And in the case of existing, we know that Google searches are also down. We know that migration is happening. If you look in the blue and the red, uh, that's where people currently are. In other words, people, when they do move or have been moving, then they've been moving to those cities at the top and generally moving out of those cities on the bottom. Well, where were they last year? Look at New York City, that outlier. Last year, a lot of people were moving. Look at this year in red, they can't move. So things are happening to affect the housing market that obviously you don't track, but I have to because I'm trying to be an investor. I'm not trying to sell a home. California realtors have expectations. I use this because I think it will help you get a sense for what we think may be coming next. Turns out that when surveyed recently, near the end of March, early April, they were asked, once shelter in place is relaxed, what do you think the number of sellers will be? Will it be higher than normal or lower than normal? And what about buyers? Well, realtors believe, those of you who are watching this yourself may have participated in that survey, fewer buyers than normal, 41% of realtors said there'll be fewer buyers versus 27 who said more, and realtors believe that 46% more sellers will happen instead of 21% fewer. In other words, crack the code, there are gonna be more sellers than buyers, and buyers, we believe, are gonna be looking for great deals. Why do we believe that? Well, because 79% told us in the survey that they're anticipating 5% or greater lower prices. 56% of the 79% said five to 10% lower, and 23%, 10% lower. Now think of this. These are largely people who at the end of 2019 were happy to pay full price. Now they're more skeptical, especially on existing. New homes, there are gonna be more incentives, there are gonna be attractive financing to go with them and so on. I believe new homes will be less impacted from a price standpoint than existing homes. And I hope for your sake that it's wrong because I'd rather you make your percentage commission on a higher price home. But if you're asking me, what do I believe? I'm telling you what based on others are telling us our survey results that would lead us to predictively analyze the future. Morgan Stanley, we, we all know, JP Morgan, when they look at existing inventory, the good news is 
the existing of inventory homes that were available to sell or, uh, to sell were at the lowest level on record going into COVID-19. That is great news. They believe from a predictive standpoint that in the best scenario, home price appreciation will be zero for, 2008, uh, for 2020. In a worst case scenario, they believe prices could drop 10% and in the middle five. Now, anytime I see somebody say zero, five, and 10, it looks like there's not a lot of sophistication associated with that bell-shaped curve. But the point is, it's yet another data point from another research source that we pay to try to get intelligence so that we can make better informed decisions. And by extension, Rob can. By extension, you know, the other guys can, you can. You know, I want Gene to benefit. I want Brent to benefit. I want Scott to benefit. And by extension, I want you to benefit from what I'm sharing because I'm going to do this anyway, and I'm not selling anything. So at the end of the day, this is for you to make better informed decisions about what you're going to do to pivot if you need to, or to optimize for what you have. There's a big shift in demand and supply that could be created from distress and opportunities. It's called supply and demand and price. Well, for those of you who've had Economics 101, you know that. But what you don't know is that before we went into this, demand and supply were more or less in balance. And now both price and demand will likely soften. But it's going to vary so much across market. So as you well know, all markets are not created in, in real estate. They're not all equal. In fact, there are 405 MSAs. Those are metropolitan statistical areas, which are otherwise known as markets across the U.S. that have at least a certain population base or more. Well, what's going on in those 405 markets? See, there is no U.S. real estate market. So anybody that ever tells you that, as soon as they say, what's going on in the U.S. real estate market, you know they don't know what they're talking about. Because the U.S. real estate market is a sum of 405 markets or millions of different census tracts. It's only an aggregate of what's going on in all those places. Every market is different. Right now, there's a concentration of jobs in certain sectors that are high risk. Think about crews. How are those companies doing? Well, the markets that, that serve those are being impacted. Think about Miami. From a cruise ship, ship standpoint, that's affecting their employment. How about oil and gas in Houston? How about leisure and hospitality in Vegas? I could go through all this, but what do I do with it? Well, I don't sit around saying, oh, it's a pretty map. No, I try to figure out if I can look at each of those six sectors and look at all 405 of those MSAs, I can then figure out which ones are high, medium, and low. Low being best. Low means they have a low likelihood of being impacted by COVID-19. Well, wouldn't you like that kind of intelligence? And oh, by the way, you can pick your market in here, and I can't show 405, but there are major markets like these. And then there are secondary markets like these. And of course, there are tertiary markets as well. But you can see third from the right, if you're in Indianapolis now, you're not likely to be as impacted as say if you were in Miami. You know, every market is different. Number three, once you've prepared, once you've started doing some of this thinking about what's going on, now it's time to start deciding. There's something called the money game that I showed many of you when we were in Mexico. This is a triangle that I drew on a napkin 40 years ago with my kid, 30 years, I'm sorry, with my kids. And I was trying to explain to him the money game. And I said, you know, there's only three things you're ever gonna have to know. How to generate income, otherwise known as cash. How to accumulate assets that will grow your wealth, either because they go up in value or they throw off income. And then keep as much of both as you can. Now. You on this call are different than me, but I do private lending primarily to flippers to generate income, generate cash. And when I'm invested in real estate, it throws off cash flow. For those of you who want to be serious investors, you may do private lending yourself or you may not, but all of you have the capacity to do real estate. For God's sakes, you know it. So why wouldn't you? You see, it's one thing to generate a commission. But there are three types of appreciation that you can benefit from. You think of market appreciation like I used to before I became a student of real estate. 
what I realize now is that there's instant appreciation where you buy a property for less than it's worth that's probably dated. Then you fix it up and remodel it and you force appreciation. And then if you do that in the right market, like I used to in San Diego or Tampa or Las Vegas or other markets, then I got market appreciation. Think about all the money you could have made over your career if you would have known what I know when I know it and you were to get in and out at the right times and you were to benefit from cash flow on real estate, instant appreciation by buying at a discount, forced appreciation by remodeling it and lifting its value and market appreciation. That is how you make three types of money. As I said, when we were in Mexico, obscene, ungodly, and embarrassing. So that's what I want for you. And lastly, um, I use Roth self-directed IRAs. You've got to do that. Um, and I happen to live in Puerto Rico with the guys on the call here uh, because we benefit from a tax standpoint. Know who you are and tweak your model. This is one thing that's going to be really important for you as you move forward. You're, you're going to fit in one of four glasses. Some of you on this call are optimists, and I don't discredit you for that. You're an optimist. You believe the glass is half full. I get it. There are some of you who are pessimists. I also don't have a problem with you. You think the glass is half empty. And there are times where I'm optimistic and times when I'm pessimistic, but what I really try to be is realistic. My glass is neither empty nor full. It's just what it is. It's just a glass of water. This allows me at different points in the market cycle to be unemotional. I can actually make better informed decisions than you can if you're being guided by what you believe or what your clients think. Because home buying is an emotional decision. Investing should not be. So if I'm more realistic, I can be an opportunist person. An opportunist is somebody like me who says, well, why, while you idiots were arguing about the contents of the glass, I was drink, drinking the freaking water and it's empty. So you don't even have a half of a glass anymore. I mean, I want to make a point here that you got to be realistic and that's what I've tried to help you be today. But I want you to be opportunistic because it's a very volatile time and this is the chance to take realism and turn it into being an opportunist. And the health and the economic crisis is still in the early stages of unfolding. I'm sorry, it's not over. In fact, the fallout is just beginning. You may have experienced the crash in 2008. You think you know what to expect and you don't. You haven't seen anything yet. And the reason I know that is because housing markets and their corrections lag. When the real estate market hit its demand peak, think about what I just said, demand peak in California, it was May of 2005. When did it crash in price? It didn't drop in price until February of 2007. It took 21 months before, while demand was dropping like a rock, for the market to finally correct. That is important for you to know. The stock market can drop, as you well know, by a third in a week. Oil and gas, look what's happened to it. It literally went through the floor. Like, it's impossible. It's never happened before, and it did it in two days. By contrast, real estate takes time, and it leaves me clues. That's why I win 99.9% .9 of the time, and you can too, whether it's on real estate sales or real estate investing. So what factors need to be present in order for home prices to crash? They're really three. The most basic are mortgage interest. And I don't have time to get into a lot of detail on this. I've got a whole slide on that. But mortgage rates would need to increase enough to discourage buyers from entering the market. Second is inventory. Inventory would need to expand substantially and quickly. And inventory could, if there are less buyers and more sellers, going into the move out of your shelter place that we're potentially going to. And then distress sales that are created by layoffs. Look, something's got to happen as a result of 26 million people being out of work. I mean, think about that, 26 million people. So at the end of the day, we're going to see loan defaults and distress sales and foreclosures if we're going to see an increase significantly and a high likelihood of a crash. That's what the Fed is trying to stave off, is a situation just like that. Now, as I said before, 
certain geographic opportunities are going to recover faster or not going to be impacted as quickly and therefore we'll be able to segment boom markets new boom towns and those markets that will have less competition think about it orlando was a very competitive market moving into this but you think that orlando is impacted by cruise yes you may have heard of somebody called disney cruise line do you think they're impacted by seniors yeah do you think they're impacted by hospitality and leisure and transport? Yes. So some markets are going to be impacted. I'm not trying to rain on your parade if you happen to be in any of these markets. I'm just telling you, be a realistic. Because what will happen and has happened already, and we've seen it before, we know the story. Um, we saw in the last month, 500,000 millionaires lose their millionaire status. At the end of 19, there were 11 million of them, including the guys that were on the call with me here. And fortunately, they had an idea this was coming. They knew, they know how to pivot. And at the end of the first quarter, there are 500,000 people who didn't, who didn't see it coming, who didn't know how to pivot. And it's dropping in April. So there are gonna be more people who lose millionaire ranks in April, and it's not gonna stop there. Now. I know what's going to happen because it happened before. It's happened in three cycles that I've been a part of, or at least been a student of, and one that I experienced full on. So the good news for those of you who are in what I call the top 1%, the top 1% incidentally are people who either generate income of $400,000 or more, or have a net worth of $2 million or more. That's generally, and I'm rounding now, the top 1%. Well, if you make $100,000 or more, you're in the top 10-ish percent. Uh, if you happen to you know, have a half million dollars in net worth, you're probably there as well. So just because you're not a millionaire or you don't make a million a year, doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you can't get there. I started in a freaking trailer park for the first 20% of my life. So I know there's an opportunity for you to capitalize, but it's all about timing. You have the best opportunity for timing moving forward, in my opinion. It may not feel like it at times, and it's not gonna be a smooth road, and it's not gonna be a gradual descent. It's gonna be a little rough, but that's okay, because that's where I call it the have-nots are gonna fall off the, the train, and the haves are gonna capitalize on this. Just like in 2007 through 2009, when all of a sudden those people who were successful, the top one percenters, they saw their income drop 36%. And then when the recovery happened, they gained it all back. While meanwhile, the 99% who lost it saw almost a flattening during the same period of time. So we've all heard this expression, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. I'm not trying to say that that's a good thing. I'm saying it's a real thing. It's just the way it is. There's a transference of wealth and you want to be on the receiving end if at all possible because the top 1% typically capture 95% of the recovery. So when you know that, and now you do, know that better days are ahead for those of us who understand this, who understand there's an opportunity and who sees it. Look, if I tell you this and you don't do anything, what's the point? I want you to seize the opportunity. Do I feel like you're going to compete with me? No, I'm looking to collaborate, not to compete. And that's what EXP is all about. It's why the guys who do these webinars for you are doing these for you. Number four, stop talking about legacy. Everybody says, oh, I want to create a legacy. Some people say, I'm going to write a book about it. Here's an idea. Just do it. How many people actually do it? How many build an amazing legacy? Very, very few. It doesn't mean they're bad people. It's just that life kind of gets in the way. I believe that you as the head of your household can believe that you can take advantage of this, take the economy and make it your economy and do it relentlessly. Do it while you're alive. Don't worry about a legacy when you're dead. What good does that do you? And those that have the highest likelihood are those that are the most successful. That's why you have to be successful. I always say to folks, when you have one option in life, someone else has all the leverage. When you have three different things that you can generate income on, just like Gene talked about at the beginning, when you have three different ways you can generate income, you don't have one option. You have multiple options. You're the one in the driver's seat. 
because at any time, any one of those could be doing the best. And at the next time, something else could do the best. What a great position to be in. Just do it. You're in lockdown. Build a legacy. Create something amazing with your family. Last year, my sons and I made a decision. We decided that, you know, after college, my two sons went to college in 2002 and 2004. And in 2009, we got back together again and created a real estate company. Go figure. And we crushed it. And in 2013, I've always said, sons, I want you to leave and outgrow me. Well, sure enough, one of them outgrew me and actually did it twice. And my other son is catching up and really crushing it right now. And in 2019, after one having done it twice and the other one doing it now, we decided to get back together again. Even though we're in different cities, we can talk, we can text, we can FaceTime, we can do whatever we need to and tell each other how much we care for each other and to capitalize on this, to take this volatility and turn it into an opportunity and to make 2020 our year. We're going to make more money, do more good, and have more fun. That's why I'm on this call. Look, if you haven't benefited at all from this call, um, then you should tell Rob and the rest of the guys. If you have benefited, you should tell them. My whole goal is to make more money because I can do more good and have more fun. And by doing that with my sons or you or Rob or Gene or Scott or Brett, I can do more and really, really be the luckiest guy on the planet. And lastly, and fifth, you've got to be a learner now. If you don't, you're preparing to fail. What do I mean by a learner? Well, in times of change, the people who inherit the earth are the people who are learning about the future. The learned, that is people who already know something, the learned find themselves perfectly equipped to deal with a world that didn't exist anymore. It's the craziest thing, but think of how big of a change things are, or thing, the pace of which change is happening right now. If you just stay where you are, you're going to be beautifully equipped for a world that leaves you behind. You're going to be a roadkill. You've got to be a learner. You've got to strive for more. You've got to want, as I call, a quest for more. I know this because it's not my first rodeo. I thrive on this uncertainty. I honestly didn't expect an opportunity like this again in my lifetime. I saw it in 79, 80, and I didn't take advantage of it. I saw it in 89, 90, I didn't. Why? Because I wasn't in real estate at that time. In 2002, I got into real estate. In 2005, I saw it coming, and oh my God, our family crushed it in the last decade. But we're at a time that's different right now, Uncertain times separate those that are amateur from those of us who are professionals. I've seen it play out before multiple times. It's not my first rodeo. In 2005, I exited the market publicly by announcing at Harvard that I was getting out. I avoided the meltdown. I also publicly announced I was getting back in the market in 2009 and 10 when it was in a free, free fall. And I was going to do it in Las Vegas. And we were going to make a fortune. And everybody looked at us like we had two heads. And we did. Now, I've been anxiously awaiting uncertainty to present itself again. Because when the market is on its run, every idiot is making money. But everyone has all the answers they think until they don't. So now people are scrambling for answers. Times are unprecedented. The question is why. And it's when and who. Well, I'll tell you what the when is. The when is now. You're not, you shouldn't be sitting around hoping like the book, The Secret, I'm sorry to diss on it, but it's not going to land in your lap. you got to seize the moment. Opportunities come around for people who are opt uh, opportunistic, not for people who are just going to watch them happen. You think about it, there's a parade. And, and I'm on the float because I want to be on the float. Now, people are sitting on the curb, and without people on the curb clapping, there would be no pro point of it, uh, having, having a float. My whole desired outcome is to be a leader while there are other followers, just like you should be, to attract people. Because the who is you. If you can do what you do now, if you can pivot if you feel a need to, if you can capitalize on the opportunity that you've got, instead of thinking you're a victim 
and being the victor, you'll be able to do amazing things. Live workshops, these are on hold. Um, we do a live workshop called Just Be the Bank, which Rob has been to, and you can see him there. So when we could do live workshops, people like Rob or Jen, who's in the foreground, or other people uh, can come and we can have, a, in fact, I think that was Rob's fourth glass of wine right there. Um, he and Jen like wine, by the way. Uh, but workshops can happen live. You can go out and show homes. You can have other people show your homes. Live things can happen. But now it's virtual time. What are the benefits of doing things virtually? Well, if you're seizing the opportunity to do virtual tours or other things, the eight benefits that I see are number one, for those of us who go places, we can save the cost of airfare. I have zero trips on my calendar for the rest of the year because I don't know when I'm going to be able to travel again. And in the first part of the year, I traveled once a week. I'm saving the cost of nights in a hotel. I'm saving the time being back and forth. I'm making more money because I'm not having to travel. I'm starting uh, and growing our passive recurring income. Um, I'm making sure that folks like you aren't solely reliant on active income by having a taste of the downside recently, which is a bad taste in our mouth, where all of a sudden the active income you were generating gets cut in half. That's no fun for anyone. You got to be a few or better. Just like the guys that invited me to this call, be a part of this fewer better community. And then when there's an opportunity to attend a, an event live, go ahead and attend it. But now participate in these virtual events. Uh, my wife Poon moved to the US about a year and a half ago from Thailand. And I thought to myself, oh my God, how's she ever gonna learn how to cook American food? And she said, I don't know if you've heard, but God made YouTube, I think. And she said, I can find anything I want. She cooks the most amazing meals on the planet. So virtually, anything can be done now. And yes, I'd rather be with you in person like I was in Mexico, but I can't be. That doesn't mean I shouldn't be. We're on a call. So my last thought, simple. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Those of you who are history buffs may remember that Winston Churchill was given credit for this in 1944, in the middle of World War II, when it couldn't have looked more dire for a lot of people, don't let it go to waste. I don't care how bad you think it is, I'm telling you, we're gonna get through it. You've gotta be decisive, you gotta take action. Opportunity is on the way for those that seize the opportunity. You can only control what you can control, so do the best you can to control it. If it's stressing you out, if it's it, causing you anxiety, if it's losing you money, I get it. I'm not going to ask you to be you know, delusional. I'm simply saying I got news for you. You're not gonna probably wanna hear it, but no one's coming to save you. A government check's not gonna do it. You're gonna need to optimize. You're gonna take the government check. It's gonna help you get through a gap. You're gonna seize the moment now. You're gonna optimize your life. You're gonna capitalize on what's coming. You're gonna stop thinking and start doing it. You're gonna invest in yourself and build relationships. You're gonna do it now during the most unprecedented phase, maybe in your lifetime. You're not gonna allow it to beat you. You're not gonna let the opportunity pass you by and you're not gonna to try to do it alone. You do, I'm telling you, from having to do it or trying to do it alone most of my life that it's not right. Let's do it together because you can get to where you're trying to go so much quicker with others, and one plus one at minimum can be three, and I like to think of the numbers one and one as equaling 11. And I'm not trying to be